Um, so it looks like we have a full crowd now. Um, so we'll get started. Um, I want to say right at the beginning, I know you have an assignment um, uh, due um, related to the slide deck that Julie talked about last night. Um, you'll have time after my session concludes to work on that together. Um, so and if there are any questions about that at the end, um, I'll step aside and let somebody who knows something about what you're doing uh, answer them. Um, but for now, I want to talk about sort of continuing our discussion of creativity and teams. Um, and last time we talked uh, about a, a few things. One is I, I offered a definition of creativity, which is that a creative idea is one that um, is both uh, novel and useful or appropriate to solving a problem. So although random bizarre ideas can be useful in the creative process, at some point the goal is to converge on an idea that is actually a, a new solution to a problem. Um, and a lot of people sort of intuitively think that the best place for creative ideas to emerge is in teams. But last time uh, we talked about the problems that arise in teams that prevent people from freely exchanging creative ideas. So we talked about uh, production blocking, we can't talk over each other. Uh, social loafing, when I'm in teams, I relax a little bit, I do a little bit less than I normally would, so output diminishes. Um, and we talked about evaluation apprehension, the idea that when you're in groups, uh, you worry about what other people think of you, and so you limit uh, the risky novel ideas that make for creativity, and you express instead the more conservative ideas that are less likely to be criticized. Um, so again, teams are, have potential for creativity, but uh, it can be difficult to realize. So I wanna continue to build on that theme. Um, one of the things that the research um, has talked about as being really critical for creativity is the way that groups make decisions. Um, and there are a number of, of procedures that people can use to make decisions that have implications for the creative process. Um, and I can stand here for the next half an hour and talk about it abstractly. Um, I don't like to do that. I actually wanna do an activity um, that will give you an opportunity to experience uh, the two decision rules that are really critical for the creative process in a way that then will allow us to discuss and compare those two ways of making decisions uh, to each other. So what I'm gonna do is talk about um, decision making in the context of a simulated jury. Um, you're gonna read two jury cases and both of them require you as a group to converge on a particular decision on the level or type of punishment uh, to give an individual that's committed a crime, uh, allegedly. Um, so on the first case, I want you to use the decision rule, the majority rules. So as soon as you have a majority um, in the group, then you can just vote and move on. Um, unanimity is not required. So as soon as you know uh, that you have a majority, you've voted, it's clear, uh, raise your hand as a group and let me know. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next case. The second case, we're using uh, the rule unanimity. So only when everyone in the group agrees on a particular course of action can we then move on uh, to, the, to the conclusion of, of today's uh, talk. So again, the first case you wanna follow the rule, uh, majority rule, second, uh, unanimity. And I'm gonna hand out the case so that you can read it to yourselves as soon as everyone's done reading, then you can just start discussing the case um, and coming to a conclusion. So on the first case, as soon as your group has reached a, a verdict that you uh, are in a majority, uh, just raise your hand and let me know. And whenever all the groups have reached a verdict, then we'll move on to the second case, which I'll then hand out. Are there any questions so far? No, all right, so I'll hand out the first case. Hand out a second case. We're going to discuss the first one after we're done with both. So now I want to set this first case aside, and we're going to go on, a, on to a second case. This one's unanimity. So only when you've reached a unanimous verdict can we move forward. So you'll see um, that this case is a little bit different. You're actually um, going to decide on a level of punishment for this individual on a scale of one to seven. And you have to agree on one number on the scale. You can't do like, you know, I think it's, you know, we 3.2 or something. That's not, <laughs> it's just one. I have to clarify for engineers who tend to be overly precise, I guess. ready to kind of take on the world. Yeah, I definitely feel that where it's like, I don't think that 
there's any reason why just love, kindness, and friendship are going to clear it all up. But I was a little bit softer on him. I felt like, I mean, either four or five. Like, I think that he also has been through a lot and really has had a rough time. And, like, that a lot of his activity seems to be a lot of lashing out against the way that he was brought up. And, like, he needs discipline, clearly. But I think he also needs just, like, some people to give him a hug sometimes. Like, you know. So I, I was thinking four or five. Which is something that needs to be addressed. So I disagree with the most out of all of you. Okay. I don't think that he should get off free. I think that's a very bad message. Because you do, in life, you do something bad and there needs to be repercussions. We are, we're all held responsible for how we live our lives. Be it just or unjust, we pay the price. Right? So he did something that was wrong and illegal and he needs to learn that when you do bad things, there is discipline. <laughs> the reason I, so I made some notes because I, I was sort of wrestling with it. Um, I'm between probably a two or three or four, and the reasons I have is one, his offenses were nonviolent. He does not have a history of violence, um, and that's a big indication. This is more so um, behavioral problems. He's lashing out in school, he's not behaving, um, and he's starting to go down a very dangerous path. Um, so I had known violence. I had a history of abuse, which I think is important. Um, this is not someone who came from a good home, who may sort of like fell on this path by, by himself. He was physically abused as a child before elementary school. We're talking, so if he's in eighth grade now, that means he was getting beat when he was between what? Fourth, fifth grade? Yeah. Right? So, you know, that's your, 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 in eighth grade you're 14, so we're talking about someone who's potentially eight or nine years old getting physically abused by an older brother, having no parental figure, right? Non-stable household. These are not excuses for poor behavior. I agree. There are plenty of people who've come from worse, who, from, from worse places who turned out to be great people. It's not an excuse. And I agree with that, that he needs discipline. My, the reason why I'm lighter on him is because when, he was, when I felt like he was getting the attention that he needed, there was improvement, and the second that that went away, that that was pulled back, he regressed. And so I guess what, the reason why I'm a little softer is because I think that if you gave him a true second chance, Especially through his high school years, right? Because high school is really where people sort of either like become good people. Or yeah, like a lot of these things come to a head. Right, a lot of these things, you know, you, you, it's it's a time where you're going through puberty. There's a lot of hormones. It's difficult. High school is generally like a zoo for most people. Um, so I'm, and maybe I'm a little softer. That's 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 very possible. So you said, I'm open to compromise. So you said a two, a three, or a four. I am willing, your range. But, but I'm open to compromise. No, I'm that's not, fine. I'm just like keeping track of what we all said. Uh, so that I it's probably easier. wouldn't agree to a seven or a six. I would be fine with a five. I just think that if he got some positive reinforcement that was consistent, because how long was this guy even with working with him? Mr. Simmons. So in August, right? So he had to repeat. So this maybe. I think it sounded like a so, year. so maybe a year or a school year, which would only be what? Like nine months. Nine months. And even halfway through the school year, that was being sort of pulled away. So I think one thing that might be helpful in this discussion is that like there is data, like there's research about positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement, especially for children, and like. A lot of the research says that negative reinforcement actually doesn't do what you hope it would do, and so I, that's something maybe we could keep in mind with this: is that he is so young that it's possible that all of this discipline, like if you go too hard on him, that it will make him rebel further. Um, where are you guys in terms of? No, we're in strong sense. No, we're here. Where's the spread? What's the? Um, it's like literally the entire gamut. The entire thing. Okay. <laughs> So only one, only one group used the nuclear option of getting rid of somebody. I hope that you actually managed to, uh, to reach an agreement. Uh, but what I want to talk about now is just to tell you a little bit about why we actually did this exercise. So what I did was um, ask one person before the discussion to take the position of seven and hold it no matter what. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you play the dissenter? Oh, okay, all right. All right. <laughs> um, I know this is funny. I actually want to start by just thanking the people who agreed to do this because it's incredibly difficult to hold that position 
for so long. Um, and it's really socially awkward. Um, and the first time I ever saw this done, I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, which you know the you know leftist liberal right. Everyone's open-minded, and so we we uh, the professor had um, five people come to the front of the room and do this in front of a huge class of 300 people, and um, she had to actually stop the demonstration when one woman turned to a guy uh, in the group and said, "If you think physical punishment's a good idea, let's go outside and I'll show you what a good idea." <laughs> and so we had to stop it, right? So. Um, but here's the, here's the point of, of the exercise, which is that we tend to think of conflict as a negative thing. And I think that we, that we could actually experience that with this exercise. But I actually want to give you a more positive view of conflict, that conflict can actually be a source of creativity, that, um, that the outcome of conflict can lead to more creative solutions, greater exploration of alternatives, a more unbiased search for information, um, a, a clearer understanding of what you believe and why you believe it. And so what I want to go through is talk about what are the consequences of conflict, good and bad, and what are the mechanisms that explain why conflict is so good uh, for creativity. But before I get into that, I actually want to hear from you. So what, are, so, uh, what was it like to play the dissenting role? What were some reactions uh, that you observed as you uh, introduced your point of view to the group? Is anyone willing to volunteer? I just want to say yeah. my group is very respectful. Right? <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. like, okay. <laughs> yeah, so did you compromise? No, you told me not. Yeah, so that was the specific instructions, like do not compromise. So one of the things we've learned about uh, dissent, there's this sort of old adage that uh, in order to have influence, you have to you know, win friends to influence people. Um, and actually, the opposite is true. As soon as the dissenter compromises, the majority tends to smell blood in the water. And, and they start to think, well, if you don't even believe it, why should we believe it? Then you're ignored and you lose influence in the group. So the most successful dissenters are the ones who confidently and consistently maintain their point of view, even though it's awkward. And so uh, what I ask you to do is actually a strategy that tends to result in the most influence um, if you're in the dissenting position. Now, flipping that around, what was the response from the majority when you learned that this person is at a seven and you're maybe at a two or a three, which is typical? What, what were you thinking about? Uh, what crossed your mind? Uh, so I'm actually curious too. You're the only group that kicks somebody out. So what was, the, what was your response over there? Get out. Get out. <laughs> Just hostility, right? That was. Uh, but what? So you? I heard something interesting here. Trying to reevaluate who I thought she was. Right. Yeah. So I had one one time. I did this in um, this. Uh, the, the group was like, oh crap, we just voted this person to be leader of our group for the whole semester, and now this person's like crazy. What are you doing? And so uh, if you're in the dissenting position, the majority will make attributions about you as a person. And what we saw um, really mimics what happens in real life. The dissenter immediately becomes the target of negative attention, aimed at changing your mind, um, and you're rarely voted to leadership positions. Dissenters aren't viewed heroically. They're viewed as people who slow the group down, impede progress, um, are stubborn, are crazy, are wrong, all kinds of negative things. Um, but the interesting thing is that the dissenter does add value uh, to the process. So I want to talk about uh, what may have happened in your group to, to make that happen. Um, and so uh, one of the things we, we could talk about is not, so when you're thinking about um, what are the consequences of dissent for the majority, a lot of people talk about who has the power, who wins, right? And I can tell you most of the time it's the majority. The majority has the power to compel dissenters to adopt their point of view. And so if you've seen the movie 12 Angry Men, when there's the lone dissenting juror who changes everybody's mind, that's interesting because it never happens. I mean, it rarely ever happens, especially in organizations where the majority has uh, power over the dissenter, um, can affect their livelihood, their opportunities, and so forth. So the majority has power. But what I want to talk about is something a little more subtle, which is uh, the power the dissenter has over the majority in terms of getting them to think differently. Um, and the basic idea here is that the exposure to dissent stimulates people to think more creatively, and that it does so through several different mechanisms. And I want to go over them uh, just one at a time. Um, one of the problems in groups, and we, we saw this last time when we talked about brainstorming um, and social loafing, is that when you get into groups, you tend to feel comfortable and safe. You assume that other people believe what you do, um, you tend to sort of relax a little bit. Other people are going to expend effort. I can you know, withhold. Um, what the dissenter does is actually make people kind of wake up and think. 
And if you look at it physiologically, there's actually been research that has looked at the hormonal responses on the part of the majority to uh, exposure to a dissenting opinion. And stress hormones actually elevate in the majority when you realize that the dissenter is questioning a core belief of yours. Um, and so it's sort of comparable to my morning ritual of pounding down five cups of coffee to wake up. So there's kind of an adrenaline response. Your pupils dilate slightly. You get more focused. You pay more attention. And that's critical as a beginning in terms of thinking creatively. You're sort of signal, there's a signal that maybe you don't know what's going on here, maybe I should pay attention, and you're gonna be more focused in terms of the effort you put into processing information. And that's really a critical first step in terms of, in terms of priming people to start to think creatively. And you may have been aware of that uh, in these groups, or maybe not because there really weren't any real issues at stake here, right? Um, but if I were to guess, you were probably more alert and aware on the second case than the first when you can just kind of sail through, get a majority and go back to chatting about your, your, your weekend or whatever, uh, which tends to happen in groups, right? So uh, the group, uh, the dissenter sort of held you up. Um, another critical part of this process is that the dissenter stimulates cre uh, curiosity on the part of the majority. So what you think is like, how could this person, perhaps somebody I know and trusted, be so wrong and yet so <laughs> confident about what they believe? And maybe I missed something. Maybe they saw something I didn't see. Maybe I misread the case material. Maybe I should go back and try and, and reconsider the information and rethink my position. Um, and, and my curiosity then compels me to try to see the world from the dissenter's perspective. And that curiosity is another piece of the creative process that's important. The dissenter makes me curious, and curiosity is the first step toward uh, becoming more creative in the way you think. And so there's another area where, where dissent is helpful. The final thing you may have noticed is that dissent uh, stimulates conflict, and conflict can be in and of itself useful because it holds up the group and forces you to consider more information. And it's not just that you, you consider more arguments and more counter arguments, but you start to think about arguments on both sides of the position. Why am I right and why is somebody else right? And, and through that process, more information is shared. And that's really critical for uncovering information that may be crucial for solving problems creatively or in any other way. And so what you start to see in groups is this groupthink mentality set in where you become overconfident about what you know, you become overconfident that the group is in complete agreement, and you start to become lazy in terms of searching for alternatives that may actually be very good and information that may be critical for solving the problem. Um, the dissenter, by holding the group up, even though they're irritating, even though they seem crazy, even though they may be wrong, forces all of these things to take place. And so if I were to guess, and you know, we could actually do this as an experiment if I were uh, feeling mean, I could give you a quiz on the details of the case at the end of the week. My guess is that you'll recall more details from the second case than the first. Because you were forced to grapple with it, uh, because this person was holding you up and forcing you to think of it carefully. Um, and so, you know, thinking about this in the context of juries, it's disturbing that any jury would be allowed to, to reach a verdict by majority rules because that's sort of a lazy, sort of thoughtless approach. We'll immediately vote out the people who disagree and we don't have to engage them in a discussion. Um, and unanimity really forces that uh, to the fore. But again, um, dissent and conflict um, can be very useful um, in terms of the creative process. And I hope this uh, case at least got to think got you thinking about how we respond to conflict, whether it's positive or negative, and potentially seeing the value of it for, for getting us to think. Um, a couple of key points I want to make here um, that people often get confused when I talk about uh, dissent and creativity. Um, the first point is that it's not the dissenter that's being creative. The dissenter is under so much stress because they're being bombarded by the majority that they actually can think quite narrowly and be very dogmatic and sort of stick to their point. But the majority is the one that's being stimulated to think more creative, creatively because that dissenter is sticking to their point of view and not wavering. And so really the dissenter is doing the majority a favor in terms of getting them to think more carefully even though the dissenter ends up paying a price as we talked about and as we saw, they're less liked and so forth. Um, the second point where this is different um, if you take a management course or anything on groups, you may 
uh, run across this idea of that there's value in diversity and that you form teams based on different people because each person might know something that's critical for solving a problem. Um, this perspective is a bit different, not that that one's wrong, but this one shows the value of dissent even when the dissenter is absolutely wrong, even when they're objectively crazy, the process of engaging them in a debate sharpens thought. And so what we have to think about is really placing a value on openness and allowing people to express controversial points of view, even if they're repulsive, um, because the value of that debate um, is, is really crucial for creativity, decision making, and all kinds of outcomes that, that um, you find important. Um, so when I talk about this with my very practically oriented uh, business crowd, right, who uh, just want to think about making a profit quickly and easily, right? Um, they're a bit skeptical of this point of view because dissent is messy, it holds things up, it, it destroys harmony and so forth, and relationships can be damaged. So a lot of times I get this question, can I realize the value of dissent by engaging in some kind of role play, um, like the devil's advocate? How many people have heard of the devil's advocate technique? Okay, so almost, okay, probably half of you. How many have actually used it on a team at some point? Um, so actually more than I usually get. Um, so the devil's advocate technique is a te technique in which people are assigned to play the role of disagreeing with everything the group says. Or if the group agrees on a particular point of view or a decision, you say, okay, now you're gonna play the devil's advocate and you're gonna think of as many ways as possible to disagree with whatever the majority opinion is. And the idea is that role playing that uh, will sort of get the benefits of dissent without any of the costs. Um, and so what I wanna do is, is present some data from an experiment that actually explicitly compared devil's advocate to authentic dissent, which is what I attempted to create um, in, in this class. And what we'll see is that the devil's advocate is really not as useful as people think it is. So in this experiment, people were asked um, in the lab to deliberate on a jury uh, decision-making case much like the one I asked you to deliberate on um, in this class. So in this one, it was a case of a washing machine repairman who was injured on the job, and you had to, de to decide as a group on how much money to give him in exchange for his pain and suffering. And so the award ranged from one, which is very small, to eight, which is more than a half a million dollars. And it was pre-tested so that most people were around a two. Um, and then the basis for the experiment was assigning people to take the role of eight. Um, and there were two conditions that we're gonna contrast here. The first is the devil's advocate condition. And in this condition, the experimenter actually explicitly came to the lab and gave people a role. It's like, okay, you're gonna be the devil's advocate. Your, your job in front of the whole group is to take the eight position and argue it as strongly as possible before your group arrives at a conclusion. In the authentic dissent condition, some groups were randomly assigned to follow different instructions one person was assigned without the knowledge of the group at all before the discussion took place to take the position of eight and hold it. So just like in your groups, you're, these people were unaware that one person was assigned to take that role. Um, as far as they knew, they were arguing eight because they really believed it. So that was referred to as the authentic dissent condition. And the results were pretty striking. What they found was that only in the authentic dissent condition did you observe any uh, of the benefits of dissent. So in the authentic dissent condition, you saw people search for more information, uh, look at the case more carefully. There was more discussion. There were more points of view exchanged. Um, and overall, the quality of the deliberation was higher when you believed somebody was taking that point of view because they really and, and truly uh, thought that was the correct outcome. Now, if you look at the devil's advocate condition, what you saw was that the group wasn't more careful, wasn't more thoughtful, wasn't more deliber deliberative, wasn't more likely to search for more information. The only measurable outcome of the devil's advocate was that they were more confident that their initial point of view was the correct one. And so all it did was make people overconfident, but it didn't make people more thoughtful. And so what I tell organizations, and, and I've been telling your teams here in terms of the value of dissent is that we really have to think about fostering the willingness to openly express dissenting solutions um, because simply relying on these role-playing techniques gives sort of the veneer of thought, but it doesn't really force people to think and grapple with issues um, as carefully as they might. Um, so there really are no sort of easy way out, easy way out here. 
Um, so in terms of takeaway points, um, again, I hope um, the, the exercise was fun. Um, and my intention, again, was not to talk about dissent in the abstract, but was to really give you a sort of a model or sort of experience of dealing with somebody who sees things differently from you, perhaps takes an issue that you view as morally repugnant, but one that you really have to sort of consider carefully. Um, and again, the message is that the free and open expression of dissenting opinions, even when they're wrong, even when they're, uh, even when they're repulsive points of view, uh, make the majority think more sharply, more creatively, more deliberately, deliberatively, um, and overall, the quality of the process is much better. Um, second point, you can't get this by acting. You really have to make sure that people feel free to express their true and honest point of view um, in order to really realize the benefits of dissent. Um, and so we have to think about, and we'll, this will be a theme as we move forward, um, how to encourage that. Um, and the final point, how, you know, thinking about conflict in your teams, how do you benefit from conflict and encourage it um, in the teams that you work on? Um, and I think that's a point that um, Julie will expand on on the slide deck to make you think about connecting your experiences of conflict to some of the points that we talked about today. Um, are there any questions? about what we're talking about? Yep. All right, so you're like bowled over in silence. Um, <laughs> so I realize I'm actually ending right on my mark, almost four minutes over. Um, so I'll stop here and I'll turn it over to Julie if, if you want to explain anything about their next assignment. Yeah. All right. Do you want to record this? Yeah, we, actually there's one question here. Oh. About um, authentic dissent, the second rough time because yeah, so that, that, was the, that was the approach that my department took in training doctoral students. I had a panic attack at my first, literally, yeah. uh, because my department was so hard on me saying, like, I don't, you know, this is terrible, whatever. Um, so there can be some value to that. But I think that, you know, if you put this in an academic context, I think that why it's important to have intellectual debates. So sometimes, at least in my field, there's a stream of research where there's such clear agreement and such paradigmatic sort of narrowness that you don't get creative thinking, right? And so it helps to know that somewhere, maybe not even in your lab, but somewhere out there, there's somebody who really thinks you're wrong and you have to, who really thinks you're wrong and is really smart and you have to think about how we're gonna counter it. And I think that's one example of, of, of how this process can be, 